Ähm, ich heiße alle herzlich willkommen zurück zur Ringvorlesung zur Klimakrise. Schön, dass ihr da seid, auch wenn es heute ein bisschen später startet. Ähm, zu Anfang haben wir einen schnellen organisatorischen Punkt abzuarbeiten, nämlich an alle Studierenden der HAW, ähm, die an den Tests teilnehmen wollen. Sie sollen sich bitte auf Emil an der Umfrage einschreiben, ähm, um sich für die Tests einzutragen. Gibt es noch etwas vom Team? Nein, wunderbar. Um, okay, then I'll switch to English for the presentation today, um, which has the title Beyond Witness, Lessons from the Field on what it means to be a human and scientist in the Anthropocene. I have the honor today to introduce you to Dr. Alison Fong. She is a microbial oceanographer and sea ice ecologist, and she serves as the co-coordinator of the Mosaic Ecosystem Team and conducts marine ecological research in various environments. Her presentation will highlight experiences from the field and how climate and biological research can help us understand our place in the world. The Mosaic Drift concluded in October 2020, but Mosaic science discoveries are just beginning to be revealed. She will also present some ideas on how climate mitigation approaches, how we as individuals can alter the course and what it means to live and work in the era of global climate change. Welcome, Dr. Fong. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction and thank you for having me um, today as part of your lecture series. Let's You're very see. welcome, Ken, thank you. <laughs> Let's see if I can share. Okay. I hope that you can see my screen. Yes? Okay. Um, so I'm currently a scientist and research coordinator at the Alfred Wegener Institute located in Bremerhaven, Germany. And today I'd really like to give you a tour, a little bit about what it was like to be a part of Mosaic and actually not what it was like, but what it is like. Um, I just came from a meeting of our, our project board of Mosaic as we prepare for a big, all hands meeting um, in two weeks time. And so Mosaic is a living, breathing project. It's still very much alive and well and underway, uh, despite the fact that our fields component uh, was completed over a year and a half ago. So first and foremost, I'd really like to acknowledge that this work um, in Mosaic and especially in the ecosystem team is funded and supported by many different entities, both at the national and international level, and that there are so many colleagues across the globe who've contributed to the success of Mosaic, both from the science and from the logistics side. I didn't have the opportunity to give credit on every single photo or image here, but this is a list of the various folks with whom um, have shared photos with me. And I just wanted to note that as again, uh, as many scientists there are, there are probably 10 times as many photos. So we were very lucky to have many um, great documentarians of, of the expedition and the project. So if you'll bear with me, I will actually start this short film and um, there is no sound with it, um, but it's to give you a chance to sort of immerse yourself in where we were and what we did. So we're at the top of the earth in the central Arctic. It's winter time. And as you can see, um, what surrounds us is ice and complete darkness. We're studying how the climate is affected by changes in Arctic sea ice in the Arctic atmosphere. And all of these people from different disciplines are coming together to work in this very harsh and very remote climate. What you're seeing are vignettes of both our work in the field and work in the lab showing slices of ice under special filters that let you see the structure of ice cores. And as you can tell, as we move these polarizing lenses, ice crystals change their orientation in space. And it's quite beautiful, which is one of the things I wanted to share with you today. 
you can also see that, you know, some of our work appears to be very rudimentary. Um, we're carrying boxes of equipment on the flow far away from the ship so that we can collect these ice cores away from artificial light pollution, away from the ship's pollution. And I can tell you, it's an extraordinary feeling to at one moment feel that you are the only person in the world and at the other moment sense just how small your existence is in this landscape. And I feel like this is a metaphor for what it's sort of like to live at this time where we're facing enormous challenges um, and it's hard to understand how you and I as individuals will move through this space and move through this time to understand the world around us. I'm hoping that you can still see everything. I'm just checking the chat to make sure because sometimes when I run this uh, video, uh, we get freezing. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just let it. And really here, um, while I could narrate perhaps a whole series, the biggest thing I want you to get from this, this short film that was created um, by a colleague of ours on the first portion of Mosaic is just what it takes to, to be out there and how special of an experience it is to work in the Arctic and to have been a part of a project that allowed us to be in the Arctic for the full year. And so I'm just going, and there's no sound associated with this video, but I'm just going to close my video and stop speaking for a short while so that you can actually see the imagery um, that's captured here. So here we are in the field. And as I said, we're over a kilometer and a half away from the polar stern and we're doing a series of different things. On the one hand, we were collecting ice cores. And on the other hand, we were trying to make a hole in the ice so that we could deploy an instrument package that would continuously measure different attributes of both the sea ice and the ocean below. Here I am actually preparing bags to collect newly formed ice um, from a lead, which is a crack between two ice flows. And I hope that it resonates on your screen the way it does on mine, but there's so much darkness around each of these individuals that it almost looks as if we're not really out in the environment, that maybe we're on some amazing sound stage that's, that's only lit with that person. But I can guarantee you, this isn't a sound stage. This is a part of the ice flow that is, as you can see, very, very flat. Um, and these are colleagues that I worked alongside um, for over four months at the very start of our campaign. 
And again, interspersed between these images of colleagues in the field, you see these colorful images of actual slices of an ice core. An ice core is cylindrical, and if you turn it on the side and slice it like you would slice a loaf of bread and take that little circular slice and place it under um, a polarizing lens and light from below, you can see the orientation of ice crystals. And why that's important is because how ice behaves in the environment is dictated by its physical properties. The way those ice crystals come together is dictated by how salty the seawater is, at what temperature the ice was being created. And this has implications beyond the individual ice crystal all the way up to how the ice cap um, at the Northern Hemisphere controls local weather patterns, controls the extent of the jet stream across North America and Europe, controls whether or not temperatures in the summertime will increase over the Russian Siberia and cause melting, increased melting of permafrost. And so it's about an ice crystal and it's also about something far bigger than a simple ice crystal. So now let's see. If you're interested in more imagery, there's a series of short videos that you can find on YouTube and other places by searching for them. Amy Richmond, who created this last video I showed you, is responsible for Into the Polar Night, which is a little bit of this imagery, but much, much more imagery with a narration by her about the science we did. There's another planetarium um, film that's available, and there's several shorter clips. And then the last two are the official documentaries that were made by a professional production company. So as I was thinking about what to speak about today, I was reminded of um, a very seminal ecologist from, from our time, even though it doesn't feel like our time. But Rachel Carson, as you know, wrote The Sea Around Us. She also was one person working as a scientist um, for the government in the United States who brought to our attention the dire situation in which a lot of terrestrial but also marine organisms were facing due to the influence of humans. And I think this quote from her book is so interesting because it speaks about the ocean and its depths as this changeless eternity. And I think you all know that indeed the ocean and our, our planet are not a changeless eternity. We have actually changed it um, in many ways by our own actions. So let's see, sorry, I need to move this. Uh, it's blocking my view, wait, I apologize for that. So what is the thinking behind why we created Mosaic. Well, before the field campaign began, the idea of Mosaic, a multidisciplinary drifting observatory in the Arctic to understand climate was actually started 10 years before we actually set sail. And that was because we were already having data available to us that indicated that not only is there global warming and that it's prevalent and that it's increasing in time, we also knew and had data suggesting that the Arctic was experiencing on average two to three times greater, more rapid temperature changes than the rest of the world. We also know that because of the location of the Arctic and our accessibility to that area, um, that we just don't have enough measurements from there. And that makes it very, very difficult to project how the Arctic will behave in response to global climate change, but also how regional changes to the Arctic will influence the global climate. And so from a scientific standpoint in the Arctic, we have the largest uncertainty and in climate projections. And part of the goal of Mosaic was to do a number of measurements and collect more observations so that we could improve how well we'll constrain projections of the Arctic. So very simply what we need are more observations um, and to help us inform models and that will help us to predict what environmental changes will impact ecosystem processes. So it's very interesting. Our community is 
um, comprised of both people who specialize in observations, but also people who primarily work on models, which means in the simplest sense, experiencing the world through a computer, experiencing the world through mathematical equations um, and simulated physics. And to join forces so that our new observations can couple to models um, is quite the challenge. It's a different language altogether. Um, but it makes for a very interesting dynamic between our community members and what we think we can do. Oh, let's see what happened there. So the basic setup of Mosaic was a nested approach. We had a local observatory that we called the Central Observatory. This is the Polar Stern and the surrounding ice around the Polar Stern. We had a regional distributed network. We used another ship as well as the Polar Stern to distribute instrumentation packages that are autonomous. Um, to measure different properties of ice, atmosphere, and the upper ocean throughout the year-long drift. And these were different nodes that allowed us to extrapolate what we were experiencing locally to a scale that was on the order of 50 kilometers. And our intention was to also have Arctic-wide linkages with other campaigns that would occur in the 2019-2020 year, especially in the summer of 2020. But we all know that um, 2020, in addition to being an anomalous year for sea ice, was just an anomalous year globally. And so we've followed up with more measurements in 2021 um, for what we weren't able to accomplish in the 2020 season at the Arctic wide level. So a few uh, numbers and statistics to share with you. On the left, the panel shows our drift track with the polar stern and it's color coded both by month and you can see um, at the very beginning on leg one, we started here in the Eurasian basin uh, north of Siberia and drifted quite close at some point to the North Pole and then towards uh, Svalbard or Spitsbergen uh, towards the Fram Strait. And we had to actually relocate the ship a few times because we drifted much faster than anticipated. Um, but in total, the campaign lasted 389 days. We had to use seven ships to help resupply uh, colleagues to the ship, to the Polar Stern, and to bring resources to us like food and additional instrumentation. In total, there were over 442 experts that came out into the field um, to do measurements and to make observations. Our community is comprised of more than 20 different nations the average age of the scientific par person out there was 39. Um, in total, we drifted 3,400 3, kilometers. We saw had more than 60 polar bear sightings over the course of the year, and that was not evenly spread out through the year. Um, we had actually several in the fall, uh, fall time, and then again in late spring and summer, but very, very few polar bear sightings uh, in the winter time. The coldest temperature we experienced out there was on Lake 3, so in the late winter and early spring at minus 43 degrees centigrade. The tallest or highest measurement that we made uh, was via sensors uh, connected to uh, weather balloons, and that was at 36,000 meters, and the part of the ocean that we sampled um, crossing the Arctic Basin was over 4,000 meters deep. And on average, to operate, the ship and to do the basic science without including um, the cost of salaries of scientists and the additional research equipment, um, it was on average uh, 200,000 euros a day to conduct this particular experiment, which is a pretty enormous number, especially when you consider that it hasn't included a lot of the other things um, that are necessary to make science happen. So the ecosystem team, in a nutshell, we're, we're there to study who's there, what they're doing, at what times of year or what times of day are they doing these activities, where in the environment are they active, are they active in snow, are they active in the sea ice, what part of the sea ice, are they active in the upper water column, what's happening in the deep ocean, and how quickly do these activities happen, and what physiological mechanisms do these organisms possess to be able to adapt and survive in the Arctic environment. And more importantly, will they have the ability to adapt to the changes that are predicted in the Arctic? So, the, oops. So this is just a couple of, this is a radiolarian, 
or visiria actually. These are, this is a chain of diatoms. These are really, really cool copepods. And these guys are actually amphipods. They are associated with the ice. This is strands of a long uh, conspicuous uh, type of algae that attaches to the bottom of sea ice called melicera. And sometimes uh, if you're lucky, you could take an ice core and see here that the melicera is still attached to it. That happens very, very rarely. Um, which is why I have this photo here as evidence that occasionally it does happen. Um, but yes, there's a lot of things happening below and within the ice that you can't see with the naked eye, um, but that we use a suite of instruments and sensors to address. So we're out there measuring the pulse of life in the Central Arctic Ocean. We're quantifying these activities and mapping different ecological functions from viruses all the way up to small fish, um, and we're trying to understand what are the linkages between these processes. We also measured a large amount of bulk ecosystem properties and fluxes of energy and matter across the ice and ocean interfaces. And that's important because in many of the models, constraining what those properties are at a given time help us to understand what the condition, the state of conditions are. And then uh, applying rate processing helps us understand the turnover of energy and matter in time space. And ultimately, the ecosystem group or team only is one component of Mosaic. We're one of the five main science teams. And so everything that we try to do in the environment is nested in both physical and geochemical context, thereby helping us bridge a comprehensive picture of what's happening um, in the Central Arctic for that year as we drift. So the next part of this presentation is very much um, a visual catalog, uh, I would say, of what we did in Mosaic from one perspective. Here you see the polar stern. Mind you, the polar stern is a very large ship. Um, it's over 110 meters long. Um, and here in the vastness of the Arctic ice flows, it looks kind of small. Um, and here you can see our logistics area and all these tiny little bits. These are installations in our central observatory. Here is a spot where we were deploying um, weather and meteorological measurements. This is another spot where there was remote sensing of sea ice. And over here, this is a spot where we had an under ice ROV making measurements of um, the upper water column. And so you can see that even though the ice camp is a real entity. It actually, when from a further perspective, looked very small. Um, and that's just to give you a context of what this ice landscape looks like. And another time of year, I should mention, that photo was taken in March of 2020. And this photo, we've relocated Polar Stern. And this photo was taken at the end of August, the beginning of September of 2020. And we're back in the region of the Arctic where we first began the drift. So we had already exited Fram Strait and we relocated Polar Stern back into the Arctic so we could continue measurements at a different ice flow. And what you can see here is that the ice flows are very fragmented. All of this blue water here, those are melt ponds that have formed on the surface of ice. Some of them have melted through and there's a connection between the melt pond and the upper ocean and others are just ponds of melted sea snow and sea ice on the surface um, of the ice flow and you can no longer uh, differentiate. And here's Polar Stern again um, from a bird's eye view. Again, really, really expansive. And again, this juxtaposition between um, feeling very, very small in an otherwise dominating um, landscape. So these are some great figures that you can check out in our uh, Mosaic special issue in the um, publication Elementa. And for the next year to two years, we will be rolling out most of our primary findings in this special issue. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about the science behind Mosaic and what we're discovering, please check out the Elementa special issue. So this is just a description of the main features that are affecting sea ice. So this is from the sea ice, the snow and sea ice team 
overview manuscript and you can see that the things that they're measuring and what they're interested in with regards to the physics and geochemistry of snow and ice relates to radiation, radi relates to ice formation. It also relates to the turbulence between an ice flow and the upper ocean. And again, the ecosystem measurements that we make are completely within the context of, for instance, how snow and ice are changing in time and space. This is an image of our colleague, oops, our colleague Ben. He's using a, um, an ice auger to drill a two inch hole through the ice. And then he will place a ruler into that ice hole to measure the thickness of ice. At some point you can imagine that ice is really thick. Multi-year ice can be very thick um, and Sometimes we did measure ice that was three to five meters thick, even though most often the ice we were working on was less than two meters. And so ice is changing over time. And so the big questions that we had in Mosaic were to really understand the evolution of these components of the Arctic climate in time space. And so that's why we really wanted to occupy and drift across the Arctic for a whole year. We didn't quite make it to a whole year, but we often say that that is a result in and of itself. At a time, perhaps 50 years ago, if this drift could have been done, I think lasting a year in the ice would have been completely realistic, completely feasible, maybe even longer. But now with the changes that we've seen in sea ice over the last 20 years, where there's less sea ice, the volume of ice has decreased, the extent of ice is decreasing, and the thickness of the ice is decreasing, we see that trying to spend a whole year drifting um, in ice is very, very challenging. And it's not something you can control. You are at the whim of the environment. But nonetheless, we make our measurements on a consistent and regular frequency so that we can capture, again, how things are changing in time, especially as the ice is evolving. So while we also work and looking from the top down, so looking from the atmosphere onto the snow and ice surface, you can imagine that we also look the other direction. So from inside the ocean interior, looking up towards the ice, bottom. And so for the ecosystem team, both components are extremely important because we have organisms that are using snow and ice as habitat, as well as residing in the ocean and understanding not just who lives and what they do in the ocean or in the ice, but understanding who lives and what they do at that interface between ice and ocean was extremely critical. And here, this is from Raba et al. Again, an overview publication from Mosaic on the physical oceanography of the system. And you can see that our colleagues were very much interested in understanding the amount of heat that the ocean absorb it, is absorbing because that has a direct impact on how well the Arctic or how early the Arctic can begin to grow ice, how long the ice will last, how well um, radiation from the atmosphere is penetrating through snow and ice into the ocean. And again, this has implications for gas exchange and the amount of CO2 that can be captured in the upper ocean. It has a lot to do with uh, circulation and turbulence, which affect the distribution of the organisms that we're interested in. So I don't want to belabor the points too much, but we use a lot of different techniques and approaches to understand different aspects of the ecosystem. And this is especially true when you're trying to get a holistic view of, for instance, food webs. So we try to categorize most of the things we do into three major branches. First is understanding who's there, so studying biodiversity, and we use a number of techniques to do that. Um, understanding their activity. So what are these organisms doing in their environment um, and running some experiments to sort of not stress them, but to understand what their responses are to certain stimuli. And then of course, as I said before, measuring the fluxes of both energy and material across these different trophic levels. So in property sense, what are those things? Well, we try to focus on linkages, but that means trying to measure a number of different processes that occur at different trophic levels. So measuring primary productivity, for instance, so organisms, photosynthetic organisms' ability to use CO2 and sunlight to generate organic carbon. 
we again weren't just looking at biodiversity, but we we're looking at the abundance of organisms and their distribution in the water column. We also looked at lots of different things like resource acquisition. So which organisms are using which type of nitrogen compounds or carbon compounds? When, at what time of year do they use them? Is there preferential usage? And then ultimately our group also does a lot of organic geochemistry, um, looking at the flow of carbon through the food web um, and linking that to other aspects like inorganic carbon and CO2 and the flux of CO2 across the ice and into the, into the upper ocean. So there's different properties. This maps just as well to the previous slide. And I, I don't want to overwhelm you with these specifics. It's just to give you a sense of all of the different types of things that we try to measure and the ways in which we use these different approaches to kind of capture this particular property, but from different perspectives. So for instance, looking at biodiversity, we did a collection um, of organisms and preserve them so that we could count them and look at them uh, taxonomically under a light microscope. At the same time, we collected those same organisms so that we could extract their DNA and RNA and create a giant catalog of genes associated with those organisms. Lastly, we collected more samples to look um, using a flow cytometer. And that's a, a coarser resolution, but helps us catalog both types and the amount of these organisms that maybe the other ways are, are not completely possible. So um, moving on, these are just some of the rate types of measurements and there are names and projects associated with these rate measurements. And the purpose there is to just give you a sense of how many different people are involved in different aspects of the work program. When I tell you that this was a communal and team effort, I think it's hard to imagine um, Mosaic being possible without all of these folks because each and every person contributed something significant to both the development and the planning of this project and helped to sort of create this very rich picture of the Arctic that has, has never yet been done. Um, so even though it might not make sense completely what each of these things are, I can tell you that they help us understand the, the ecosystem and ecosystem functions from a perspective um, that is just unprecedented. So one thing that we're looking at is this idea of changing fauna. So the changes in macro fauna in the Arctic. And part of the reason that we're interested in this is because the central Arctic is still considered one of the places on earth that is, is not necessarily experiencing melting of sea ice in the way that the periphery of Arctic sea ice is along coastal regions like the Barents Sea, um, uh, in the Beaufort, for instance. And the reason we're looking at that is because in this Atlantic sector, this European sector of the Arctic, we have an inflow of the Atlantic Ocean through the Fram Strait. And what that could do is actually as sea ice retreats and becomes less of a barrier, we could see that more and more organisms that are typically temperate Atlantic organisms are migrating into parts of the Arctic and potentially even the Central Arctic. So this is one thing that our group is studying. Um, and this has huge implications for the food web. As you can imagine, if organisms have evolved together um, in a certain way and suddenly you're introducing new species with different nutritional composition that as you move up the food web, this could have uh, implications for things like fishes and seals and certainly polar bears. The other thing that I mentioned is that we're collecting a large number of samples to look at DNA and RNA, again, from viruses all the way up to uh, macrofauna organisms. Here's a slide showing our focus on single cell eukaryotic organisms. So things like protists and phytoplankton that are associated with sea ice and in the water column. And this is just some preliminary data to give you a sense of how many different metagenomes we're, we're creating. And we're constantly um, in this process. Every, every month I get an update about where we are in our metaomics sequencing with partners in the United States. And I can tell you, it's an enormous catalog. And when you think about how many millions of sequences are generated from a single sample, um, we will certainly 
uh, exponentially increase the number of genes recorded from the Arctic Ocean. So this is an unprecedented effort um, to really, really catalog uh, single cell life forms in the Arctic. So some of the organizational statistics from my team, and overall our team on board for each leg was somewhere between six and eight persons. And to accomplish this work, it was something on the order of 40,000 person hours over the course of the year, um, just to complete the field component, not including the components of planning and programming, and now the analytical component in the labs back at home. We have over 19 individual project contributions just to Team Eco. Um, and those, are, like I said, span from understanding ridged sea ice and viral populations, all the way to looking at whether or not uh, populations in polar cod and other Atlantic cod species are increasing or decreasing um, in, in the central basin. There's tons of interesting and cool things we were able to do with our colleagues from other teams. And I feel like this is one of the best and most uh, rewarding aspects of Mosaic is this intersectional relationship of the different disciplines attacking questions from different perspectives. And so we work together very closely with the sea ice and biogeochemical teams and also the atmosphere team to understand what are the linkages beyond our traditional um, discipline linkages that we can study in this very, very unique setting. Um, and so we're looking at things like sea ice life and the impacts of turbulence on the distribution of microorganisms. We're also looking at the evolution of ice surface conditions and what that means for microbial communities, which may contribute to aerosols and the production of clouds in the atmosphere. So really interesting things that um, you as an expert might not be able to tackle, but are able to do when you have a team of experts from different disciplines. So this is just an image um, from our Lake 5 ice flow, which isn't where we have the main time series, but this is a really cool thing that happened. We had a panoramic camera installed looking forward of Polarstern, so looking over the bow of Polarstern from a very, very high uh, point on the ship. And what it allowed us to do was take multiple photos a day from a stationary position so that we could actually have a diary of what things look like, what the environment looked like. And you can see over the course of several days, the ice conditions are changing, right? So we have to the left, we have this opening of water um, in September. And before that, in the end of August and September, you actually see that the surface of ice and the water is changing color. And that's because between the 31st of August and September 4th, we actually had a snow event, right? We had falling snow. And so suddenly these bluish melt ponds, they're kind of visible as grayish entities here. And that's because there's snow. And what that does is it changes the whole dynamic of how melt ponds are functioning on ice flows. It changes the dynamic of ice formation. And then ultimately it changes how organisms respond to, to that newly formed ice. At the same time, you can see on any day that we have shifts in the dynamics of ice around us. And this is a really critical thing because you never really know each morning what you're going to anticipate. We have very, very good weather predictions. We have a morning meeting to allow us to get debriefed. But until you are out there looking out the window, standing on deck at your environment, you just don't know what the day will bring you. Um, and this is, again, one of the main reasons why we wanted to occupy the Arctic for a full year is because these are not time series that you can really fully understand without seeing things day to day shifting over the course of a 24 hour period. So in that way, Mosaic is extremely unique because we captured events that we otherwise would have missed in a four week or six week long campaign. This is just another view. So this is from a drone that's flying over the flow. So here's Polarstern, here's the bow of Polarstern, and this is the flow. So we're starboard side along the flow. And uh, it's not very big, actually, in comparison to the other flow we were working on. This is quite small. It's about 300 meters by 300 meters. And again, I'm giving you a little time lapse of what the surface conditions look like um, in a two and a half three week period and you can see 
from that same position just how interesting the surface of ice is changing. And these are the types of changes that we hope to capture. Um, and we were out there making a number of measurements and we can bring those back and get together probably in two weeks time to talk about how those observations relate to what we measured via our sensors and our instruments and by taking ice cores. I love this photo. So this is again, a photo from above looking down onto the ice flow. I've taken you in a different timescape. This is in July of 2020. This is the original ice flow that we found in October 2019. And so we've been occupying it. This flow eventually broke into hundreds of little pieces of ice. Mm -hmm. But before that happened, there was a weather a weather blimp that was deployed with a number of sensors to measure atmospheric properties and they attached a GoPro to it. And so we're looking down from that blimp onto our ice flow and I have to move this bar again. And this is the, this is the outline of our flow. It's a little bit hard to see, but this is the outline of that flow. And you can just see how heterogeneous the surface is. You can see that it's darker in some spots. That's because there's sediment that has been incorporated into the ice when the ice was being formed. It interacted with the Eurasian shelf and picked up sediments, seafloor sediments. And then those became incorporated into this ice flow that was on average two meters thick. We also have another weather blimp here. That's what that orange thing is. And I just think it's so cool because you can also see that we're sort of in the clouds. That's why it's sort of fuzzy like that. Oh, this is a zoom in of how ice and snow crystals change. I hope you can see this on your screens, but you see these tiny little crystals forming. These are super cool. They look like giant diamonds. Um, and occasionally you come across them when you're work walking across the flow because of the way ice is interacting with its environment. Temperatures are changing, it's summertime, you get melting, but then at night you also get refreezing. Um, and water molecules rearrange themselves to form these beautiful ice structures. And so I just wanted to share with you um, at a very small scale how beautiful ice and water can be. And this is a direct um, a direct representation of how, if you ever are in chemistry class, how a water molecule H2O and has this bend in it, how that actual structure is manifested in ice crystals. And again, driven by physics, driven by temperature changes, driven by really, really cool. So what else about ice cores? I spent a lot of time talking about ice. We had a joint effort of ice coring primarily between the physics team and the eco team. Here are some of those images that you saw earlier in the video that I showed you. And this is an ice core. This is the bottom of the ice core. This is the top. And you can see that these images are taken through a polarized lens, which is why you see the different colors. And all you need to know here is that this looks different from this because the ice crystals are oriented differently in the column of ice. And what that allows us to do is understand how the stratigraphy of ice influences not just its physical properties, but where organisms are in the ice column, because there are different pockets of air and space and brine space, depending on how those crystals are oriented. And we measure things like the salinity of ice and the temperature of ice. The solid line is a winter profile. You can see here surface ice is very cold, less than 10 degrees centigrade. And then as you move into the interior of ice, it actually gets warmer. And that's because the surface ocean is warmer than the atmosphere above. And so that ice is warming from below, but cooling from the top. This you can see dash line is that the ice is really warm. This is from July. 2020. And so the ice surface is practically the same temperature as the atmosphere. And we have very little variation because now the atmosphere has been able, the temperature from the atmosphere, that incoming radiation has penetrated the ice pack and is warming the ice. And therefore you get, you begin to see melt. So again, really cool changes in temperature in melting, change the way organisms interact with their ice environment. And that's what we study from the ecosystem side. Out there is a team, another hole in the ice. This is a simple hand pump with a hose and we're collecting water that's at the interface of the upper ocean and ice. And we're going to do a whole bunch of measurements with that. At the same time, if you look in the other direction on the ice flow at the edge, you can see that around us, 
there's very, very small fragments of ice. This is late July, 2020. We're heading towards the Fram Strait at a very, very fast pace. And the ice around us is starting to break apart. As I said, we studied everything from viruses to fish. Here are some of my colleagues collecting and measuring the fish that we collected on the long line. Again, uh, there was a hole in the ice and we deployed a long line with hooks and let it um, be out there for an extended amount of time and they were able to capture fish. Um, for those of you who are familiar with fish, these are Atlantic species, which was not what was necessarily anticipated. And there's a recent paper in Science Advances on this. So if you Google fish and mosaic, that will pop up. This is myself and another colleague out on the ice, and this is on Lake Five. So this is September, 2020. And now we've transitioned out of the summer and we're entering the Arctic autumn. And what happens during that period is new ice formation. So it might be a little bit difficult to see, but this is all new platelet ice that has grown on a 10 centimeter thick piece of slab ice. And here my colleague, Ulrika, is cutting out cubes of newly formed ice. She's on the ice flow. This is a lead that's freezing over. This is another ice flow. And we're getting tiny little cubes of ice to make measurements on. This is a frost flower. These things form in very specific conditions. Um, and again, if you were to zoom in on that flower and look at the structure of ice crystals, it grows in that way because of the physics and chemistry of water and how water molecules interact with one another. So for me, working primarily on microorganisms, which you can't really see with the naked eye, but being able to see ice crystals as their immediate environment, I feel like this is just such a profound image of how structure, physical structure, um, frames how you think about organisms that are otherwise invisible. And again, just showing you some differences in the ice flow surface. A lot of my colleagues, if not all of them, we spend time on board in the lab. We are consistently bathed in red light. The reason being that the organisms we study, even when collected in the summer, are very, very light sensitive. And so we use red light, which is less likely to stimulate organisms, whether they're eukaryotic, um, organisms like phytoplankton or eukaryotic organisms like copepods, we use that red light so that we don't artificially uh, create a response. And so all of our filtrations and our experiments happen in these very special light conditions um, so we can reduce our impact on them as much as possible. So this is uh, my colleague, Katie, and she's in the lab running her experiment about the production of copepods um, and eggs, as well as uh, copepods grazing on phytoplankton and sea ice algae. We do a lot of net toes, and this is just uh, a collection from a net that was deployed on an ROV, so an under ice uh, remotely operated vehicle with a net attached to it. And you can see this is from three different depth horizons, and you can just see by looking at it that there is a different concentration of organisms at each of those horizons. And so one way in which we study how the ecosystem is functioning is by understanding which of those organisms are there and how abundant are they and what are they eating. Um, and we always think that this is a, a nice way to show these tiny organisms um, and how they differ in space. And again, this is all within the upper 50 meters of the water column. Ah, this is another little video. So this is in July of 2020. It's the summer. We have 24 hours of sunlight. These long greenish yellowish brown strands are Melicera. They're conspicuous. It's a type of plankton. It attaches to the bottom of ice. You can see it's flowing because the ice is drifting. There's a current. And then you can see these little bits. These are little ice crystals. This is newly forming ice in summer because what's happening here is we have a freshwater lens. Ice is melting, it's primarily fresh. It's coming on top of the salty seawater. And then you get this um, stratification and these, these strands and filaments of Melicera are occupying that stratified layer. So this was super cool. Sometimes when we're trying to relax out there, we just play this video over and over again um, to try to decompress. But in general, we were so excited to see this. Again, just stuck a GoPro through a hole in the ice um, and voila. 
So what else is out there? Well, this is again, uh, stratification, same time of the year, July, 2020. And this is not Melisera. This this thick yellowish brown stuff, this is phytoplankton. And this is primarily phytoplankton that lives in the ocean, not sea ice algae. So above is a freshwater lens, and then below is the salty seawater of the ocean. And in between, because of the physics of the system, you get this interface where it's kind of brackish. Um, and this is where these organisms become trapped and they begin to grow because it's a balance between enough nutrients and enough light and they're very happy and then they grow. And this is why we see this very, very thick concentration of organisms. So again, this is something that you can happen upon maybe on a shorter expedition, um, but we actually saw this evolve day to day from week to week and from one day to the next, it was there and then it disappeared because the physical conditions around our flow changed uh, due to wind and due to drift speed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is again, um, when I talk about stratified and a thin layer and something that's ephemeral, this all is happening in the upper one meter of the water column directly below the ice. That's an image of Melisera. This is what ice can look like when it has things growing in its brine channels. Sometimes in the Arctic, you get this view of it being very, very green. Um, it's again, relatively, well, we can't even say, we don't know if it's rare or how common it is because we're just not out there enough um, surveying enough to make those types of measurements. But it is really cool when you come across something like this um, and look into what it is and what's there. I love this one. This is actually newly forming ice. This is about two centimeters thick. And I hope what you can see is that there's these things that look like fingers, this vertical fingers, and what those are, are actually brine channels. And so when sea ice is made, the ice forms and it ejects the salt. And what you get are these channels in sea ice that you wouldn't otherwise get in freshwater ice. And it's these channels where organisms like sea ice algae and phytoplankton and flagellates and dinoflagellates kind of live. And so you can see that because this is September of 2020, there's still material left over from the summer that has become incorporated into the newly forming sea ice. So again, this is a way in which we're trying to understand how sea ice acts as an environment to control, say, carbon cycling, because there's a ton of carbon held up in these organic particles. This is to give you another view. We also, when not working on the ship, we also had what I called eco lodges. These are little tents and inside they're, they're filled with lab equipment, simple lab equipment like pumps and filters and bottles. Um, and we have a hole through the ice and we're collecting water and processing it right there um, and doing that on a near, I say every two to three hours. And that just allows us to capture different dynamics um, that we otherwise couldn't capture from the ship's platform. And this is all in the upper ocean. Um, and we occupy these tents for 24 to 30 hours continuously to do these measurements. So again, just something really, really special to be out there with the team working um, continuously to kind of capture phenomena that you couldn't capture at a weekly scale. We also had things like sediment traps. For those of you who are familiar with oceanography, sediment traps are pretty important. They collect sinking material, passively sinking material from the upper ocean to the deep ocean. This is um, a sediment trap that looks like a big funnel. And at the bottom of the funnel is a bottle that's on a carousel and the carousel is programmed to rotate. Um, however you want it to rotate, in this instance, every two to four weeks, and it captures that material and collects it for an integrated amount of time. And what you can see, this is October of 2019, all the way to August of 2020, uh, 20, 16 through 21 are empty because we already had to collect the sediment trap before then. And this is just to show you that the different amount of material at different times of year um, in each of these bottles. So that helps give us a record of how productive the ocean is and how much of that material is sinking to the deep sea. This is the winter time. This is the polar stern we're alongside and here's a hole in the ice and we're deploying what we call a ring net. And this ring net is one meter across and the mesh size is something like 200 microns and that collects all of the small animals in the upper thousand meters. And this is an image of some of our images of some of the types of organisms that we collect from a thing like the ring net. 
So very, very cool amphipods, um, a selection of copepods. Um, and the imagery is so sharp on some of these instruments that we have in the lab that you can actually see like the fat vacuole and the contents inside of a copepod because they're relatively translucent. You can also see um, their egg pouches. Here you see their clutch of eggs from copepods. Very cool. There's squids. We saw um, a ton of different types of jellies and pteropods and again, radiolarians and some pelagic uh, nematodes and things like that. So just really cool stuff out there. Um, and like I said, there's some really nice instrumentation that we have that is the combination of a plankton net or a zooplankton net hooked up to a camera. And so as it moves through the water column, it also has organisms passing through a cuvette and you can take pictures of those organisms. These are images from that instrument. So cool. It's a copepod, um, these Calanus copepods. And you can see here the egg sac. And they can actually identify what type of species of copepod this is by looking at the antenna and looking at the um, segments along the body. That's just to give you a sense of how, how remarkably sharp the resolution is for some of these things. And also how extraordinarily tedious it can be to work through all this data. These are tiny little polar cod. They're about this big, I would say, maybe 10 centimeters long. And we found a lot of them living in little cracks in the ice. And these guys are really interesting because they, they both feed on sea ice algae and sea ice organisms like those amphipods and copepods that we saw. And they serve as important food for larger fish um, and things like birds and seals, which of course support higher trophic levels. I usually don't include polar bears in my presentation, but I thought this is an Arctic presentation with a very broad audience. And, and certainly most people would expect some images of polar bears. I was actually quite lucky. I was out in the field um, during the time periods where we had the most polar bear sightings. So at the beginning of the campaign in fall 2019, and then again in the summer uh, and early fall of 2020. And this is a, a mama polar bear with her cub. Um, and this is a super zoom lens, so um, by, no, by no means are we close to these organisms at all. We, we keep our distance and, and try to stay out of their way. But they are uh, phenomenal creatures, and to see them in their natural landscape is, is really remarkable. So here's just a list of some of the initial observations that my team um, and others in the mosaic community are really excited about in terms of ecosystem properties and processes. A lot of it is related to this idea of a time series. It's the longest time series we have from the central Arctic of all of these different properties that help us build this comprehensive picture of the Arctic ecosystem and how it may respond to future changes in the Arctic. It was also just a really great opportunity to be curious and discover things and be surprised um, by the environment. So then the question is, is this a sunrise or a sunset? Hard to tell. And I think that's also true of science and our role as scientists in, in a world where um, lots of reports are are relatively negative about, about the state of our climate and the state of our planet. And so I really had in my title that this is about going beyond the idea of witness. As a scientist, I've been trained to be a witness. I've been trained to observe the environment, observe natural phenomena and to test that phenomena. But to be a witness is only to observe. It's, it's not to do. There is no action in witness. And I think each of us in our own way are witnesses to what is happening in the world, um, whether it's in our local communities or at a global scale. And so my challenge to all of you when thinking about not just something like mosaic and how interesting it is as a scientific endeavor, but thinking about sort of the lessons beyond science that it teaches us. So this is really more of a personal take um, from me about what it means to have been a part of something like that and to now be in a position to talk about science, to talk about climate and to talk about our role as individuals. So my suggestion about climate mitigation in our climate crisis is to actually focus on something that I know 
formally very little about, and that's people. Though I have to admit that my role in Mosaic is, yes, centered on things of the Arctic ecosystem, but more importantly, as a coordinator and scientist, I've been tasked with connecting people and connecting people to their environment and to what it means to study the climate and then to act when you see that what we're doing to the planet is, is detrimental. I think that's really important. And so here, I can't emphasize enough that the thing that's most critical, I think, in, in working in climate science and working in natural science is that we are people and we are living and working with other people. And to address what's happening in the world takes us first and foremost understanding that at the heart of global climate and what we choose to do about it is centered on how people, both as individuals and as communities, react to what is happening and the choices that we make. So much of Mosaic, as you can imagine, is about having a shared vision. And I think this is some place where we need to do more work um, in this idea of how we slow and stop global climate change and how we actually bring the people that we need to the table. So building that vision or share and sharing that vision, but ultimately building trust in our community and not just among scientists and not just among policymakers, but across all sectors to understand what each of us contributes to the conversation on how to build a more sustainable world, um, not just for you and I, but for all of the people um, that are affected by climate, which oftentimes are not the people contributing most to climate. And so having that awareness, um, I think will transform how we approach the challenges that we face in terms of global climate. And, and to do that, of course, you have to have a shared vision of what we aim to accomplish together um, and building that trust. But I feel like that's at the heart of how we transform all of this amazing energy and potential that each of us has into a, a capacity to find a new way of living in a planet that needs that needs better taken care of. And that better taken care of is our responsibility. Um, and when you think about it that way, I think it starts to change your relationship with climate, with what you can do, what we can do um, and what our roles are. So <laughs> this was actually part of a talk that I, that I gave about teamwork. Um, and I used basketball as an analogy because I played basketball a lot as a, as a young person. And it's also about keeping your eye on the ball and staying focused on those main goals um, and that shared vision. So some of the key lessons. So this is all about people. This isn't even about science anymore, but that's the thing. And I'm sure that you've heard this in other lectures and will hear this in other lectures is that we have the science, we have the data. We have resounding amounts of data. The newest IPCC report came out this year um, and it's, it's impossible to argue with what the data says. We have caused global warming, we are causing global climate change and we have a very limited amount of time to do something about it. Um, and these things may not seem like the things that we talk about regarding climate mitigation approaches. But I would argue that without these things, climate mitigation will never happen because these are the things that you need to do to, to get people to work together, to get people to see what is possible. And I think that's the most important message as a scientist that I can give now is to present facts, not negate the fact that there are very concrete facts that are scary, I would say, but to now formulate a path forward. And that path forward is a path that we take together. And it's a path that requires each of us tapping into our strength and our voices to come to innovative solutions about what to do. And if it's human centric, then you have to think about what drives human beings to want to do things. And, and it's remarkable actually how important human psychology plays 
and not just um, things like how do we create an environment that's more just and sustainable, but also for building scientific teams to do the science that's necessary to inform decisions, should you want to do that. But I found that with my team, some of the most important things that we did um, that helped us be successful and helped us support one another in our goals was to support that joy and support the curiosity of wanting to know and wanting to be better at what you do and wanting to understand what the impact of your work may be. And obviously adjusting and adapting is something we will all have to do. But I think the biggest thing we need to think about is how we adjust our expectations of, of what the world can be and how we play a role in, in creating that adjustment. I often think it's so important uh, that you're always growing and always learning and that you celebrate each of the things that you accomplish, whether they're small or large, because we need to be able to um, celebrate what is positive in the world, even though that there's so much um, difficult and challenging and negative things happening in the world. It's so important to still find what it is that you as individuals and as a community can come together on um, that brings us together in a much stronger way. Because that's really, for me, the only way I think we'll be able to tackle these huge challenges in front of us. People are most certainly our most valuable resource. I think some people would argue with me that the Polar Stern at the Avi is our most valuable research uh, resource for, for polar research, which it most fundamentally is critical. But at the end of the day, people are where it's at. It's, it's the most important aspect of how we tackle global climate um, and putting people at the center of that at all different levels um, will hopefully help us come up with ingenious ways um, to solve this crisis. And ultimately, I hope that each of you think about how you can give to that effort in whichever ways you feel most strongly about. So this is a few images of my team, just a very small section of them. And we're still trying to have fun out there and working. And again, the question is, is it a sunrise or a sunset? And I think the reality is, uh, we decide that and we decide how to proceed. So it's all about perception. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your incredible presentation. That, that did sound like a research adventure of a lifetime. It was, yeah. Um, yeah, it was. We actually have a ton of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, and we're not going to be able to cover them all, but I think some of them are very interesting and I would like to ask you some of them. Wait, let me, that's, it's a huge list. Um, maybe we can start with I saw a very interesting one here. Um, where did it go? Um, it was about your motivation to depart on this research and how did you come by to be a part of the team? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I came to the Alfred, I'm American, and I did my graduate work in oceanography, biological oceanography at the University of Hawaii. I'm not from the, I'm not from Hawaii, I'm from Rhode Island, which is on the east coast of the United States. And I was looking for a postdoc position. And a colleague of mine was starting a new group at the AVI and invited me to participate in her research group as a postdoc. And so I came to Germany with the mindset that I would be there for three years and work on a very specific project and then move back to the United States to do whatever. I have been in Germany now for over eight years. And um, I can tell you that you can plan and we tried to plan a lot, but ultimately um, opportunities arise, which change the course of your life and your career. And Mosaic was certainly one of those. I did not come to the AVI initially because of Mosaic. When I arrived at the AVI, Mosaic was sort of still considered a fantasy. Uh, we didn't have 
We didn't yet have all of the funding. The Polish Stern was not committed. Uh, we as an ecosystem team were a loose construct at best. But as time progressed during my postdoc, it became clear that Mosaic was turning into a real thing. And once it began to gain momentum, which was really after um, the Polish Stern was committed by the Avi and by Germany, it was clear that this had real legs uh, to stand on and to move. And that was the catalyst that this project needed for us to garner the international contributions that we ultimately received, making it over 150 million euro project. So that happened in spring 2017 when the Polish Journal was committed. Um, and from then until 2019, we basically worked tirelessly to figure out all of the bits and bobs that are necessary to make this type of science possible. For me, it was clear that I was either going to be a part of Mosaic or I wasn't, and I had to decide if this was something I wanted to do. And if I was going to do it, then I knew that I would fully, fully have to commit um, and that it would take many years of planning and commitment before I would actually see any returns on that. And now I am, of course, but it's been an uphill battle, um, but one that I feel extremely grateful to be a part of. Um, the community, as you can imagine, I can't say enough uh, good things about the community and what it means to be part of a project like this. Um, and that happens on much smaller scales. It's just an amazing thing to be surrounded by other people who are as curious, if not more so, about the environment as you are. And that type of energy just, I think, electrifies uh, the pursuit of knowledge. So you know, working long days, it feels like, I mean, it feels like something because I'm older than I used to be, but it really feels like nothing because it's just a joy um, to be able to do that type of work and to be completely immersed in it. And that's, that can be true of any type of work that you believe in. Um, so yeah, it was a very unexpected opportunity. Um, and I, I never regret obviously being choosing to be a part of it. So I'm really thankful for that. Thank you. Um, there's another good question, I think, that is, um, what was most surprising in the overall experience? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good question. There's a lot of things that I was surprised about. First off, I think what I'm most surprised about is people. People are such strange creatures. You know, as an oceanographer, my whole point was to get away from people. Like I didn't want to be a medical doctor because of like, oh, people, complicated, very complicated multicellular organisms with feelings. I don't want any of that. I'm gonna go work on marine bacteria over there. Um, they're single cell organisms. I mean, how complicated could be? Turns out marine bacteria are also very complicated, but not as complicated as people. So what I was most surprised about, I would say is that as a whole, as a project, Mosaic, we probably underestimated how people add complexity to the project and what you want to do. Because as I said, people are at the heart of science. They're at the heart of everything you're trying to accomplish. And trying to build a shared vision among 400 plus people is no easy task. So I was most surprised at, on the one hand, how people and their involvement in Mosaic created complexity beyond natural complexity of the Arctic climate system. And also at the same time, how you could actually bring that many people together. Um, that was pretty remarkable to me. The other thing that I was shocked about from a scientific standpoint is how quickly we saw things grow. You know, there's been this paradigm in Arctic ecosystem science that it's driven by organisms that use sunlight for energy. That's pretty fair. Um, but what we noticed is that these organisms have evolved over time to be finely tuned to their environment. So they can literally use very, very tiny amounts of photons, incoming photons, and already begin to grow. So they kind of, these single cell organisms, they kind of, hiber they kind of hibernate in the winter. They keep their cells intact. They keep their photosystems. They keep their photos, you know, they keep their photosynthetic pigments like chlorophyll. And they kind of just, you know, maintain very, very low metabolism. But what's critical 
is that when the light returns after the polar night, after polar winter, and you're transitioning into summertime, just that little bit of incoming irradiance turns those cells on. And so we actually made measurements in sea ice and in the upper water column of those cells turning on. When in the past, we would never have considered such low light intensities as being possible for net growth of things like sea ice algae. And so that's one really exciting story that we're working on and sort of totally unexpected. I mean, you hypothesize it, but until you have that concrete data, in your hands, you, you don't really believe it. And we have uh, data that suggests that that's possible. Oh, I think you already jumped to my next question. It's exactly about um, the things growing there. Um, can you tell us, you said they grow with um, very little light. And can you maybe give an example of what kind of things there were growing there? Yeah. Sure. Well, so the thing is, a lot of the people I work with are, are, are focused on things like phytoplankton and sea ice algae. So eukaryotic protists um, that are at the base of the food web. But on the other hand, myself included, are people who study organisms that don't rely on sunlight. So things like bacteria and archaea. And actually, you know, a lot of the measurements I made at the darkest times of the year are, and in the deeper part of the ocean, are to address these really cool organisms, single cell organisms that are growing and utilizing different organic carbon compounds to, to create biomass. And they are actually part of an important part of the carbon cycle. So those organisms, I mean, the bacterial diversity is, is enormous. So this is thousands, if not tens of thousands of different strains. And some of the charismatic phytoplankton or sea ice algae, I mean, this is Phalacia syra, this is Pseudonychia, this is like the Melicera images that I showed that grow these very long filaments. Um, but yeah, I didn't show enough of this, but we actually have some light microscopy micrographs of the samples that we took. And you can see just how diverse the phytoplankton are, both from the sea ice and in the upper ocean. And so these things are growing, they're food for copepods and amphipods. I said, and uh, it's remarkable. So we're, we're trying to understand how fast they're growing. So we measured primary productivity um, and we're trying to understand which portion of the community is contributing most to primary production because there's also a good chance that they are the primary food sources for um, zooplankton and mesoplankton. So those are just a couple of the things that are growing. We also get things like dinoflagellates, um, yeah, lots of cool single cell organisms. And I'm sorry that I actually, I don't have um, any of those micrographs to pull up, but yeah. It's okay, we saw a lot of them in your presentation. Um, another good question is, came in, um, how important would you say is the Arctic ecosystem in a global context? And what Ooh. implications will climate induced changes of this ecosystem have for the rest of the globe? That's such a great question. So in the past, the Arctic has kind of been thought of the smaller or the lesser important of the two poles, right? The Southern Ocean is a continent with a large ocean surrounding it. And that ocean is responsible for sequestering a, a lot of atmospheric CO2. And the Arctic is different. It is an ocean surrounded by continents, but it's in the Northern Hemisphere. And so um, it has, and its ice cap have direct implications on northern hemisphere populations, which is where most um, of the densely populated areas are. So the question about Arctic ecosystems and what it means, well, as the Arctic ice uh, conditions are changing, and also the continental areas of the Arctic are changing due to global warming, we, in, we expect to see really strong changes to ecosystem function. For instance, Siberian permafrost holds enormous amounts of methane, enormous. And actually the thawing of permafrost could release so much methane um, that it would change actually the temperature drastically more than the amount of CO2 that we expect um, to, to increase in the coming decades. That amount of methane is 20 times um, stronger at causing global warming 
Um, and so that's what the implication there is really big. The other thing is increasing the temperature means that microorganisms are respiring faster. That means they're using uh, using more organic material and creating more CO2. So you're increasing the rate at which certain processes in the organic carbon and nitrogen cycle are occurring. The turnover of that material may have implications for food webs, both terrestrial and marine food webs. So we're continuing to study this, um, but it has big implications because some of these organisms actually produce climate relevant gases besides CO2. They are organisms that produce methane. Um, there are organisms that also use methane. And so understanding what the balance will be as temperatures increase and you have a loss of sea ice in the Arctic will prove to be really important. The other thing is, and we don't talk about this much, but Organisms and the types of organisms that live in sea ice also change the physical characteristics of sea ice. And while it might be relatively understudied and the contribution to the overall ice condition is not quite known, when you have organisms living within the ice column, ice melts differently. It melts at a different rate. And so this has a huge implication for food webs and the melting and loss of ice you know, people don't think about it very often because it's so far removed from where we live day to day. But how much sea ice there is in the Arctic dictates much of our weather. It dictates the jet stream and how much the jet stream oscillates, how far south it becomes. It also dictates this idea of the polar vortex, again, related to the jet stream. It also dictates where we can anticipate precipitation. So not understanding how ice will change in the Arctic means that we're less capable of understanding and predicting what will happen in mid-latitudes, which is where a large portion of the world's population lives. So there are, there are implications all the way from weather patterns um, to the accessibility and location of freshwater precipitation, all the way back up to feedbacks and how this warming effect um, changes the seasonal cycle of organisms in the Arctic. Um, and it, it, the list goes on and on, probably too many things uh, for me to discuss in depth today, but there's quite a bit of data that we have showing the linkages between what happens in the Arctic. It doesn't stay in the Arctic. Um, and that's certainly the case as we continue to cause rapid change in that area of the globe. Wow, that was an, a big list of things that could happen. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> Yeah, so it definitely is a topic of global importance. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the expedition itself? There were some questions about, um, like, did you stay on the boat the whole year or could you go home for a limited time? Or how do you prepare for such a long and dangerous expedition? Yeah, so there's quite a bit of quite a bit of planning and training that goes into preparing participants to be in the field. Um, we're very remote, so we had many risk assessments and contingency plans to make sure that we were always within a certain distance from the nearest emergency uh, helicopter or airplane uh, position. So that dictated where we began the drift so that we could approximate the different probabilities of which direction we would drift and to maintain a radius um, to those stations on land should we run into any um, serious problems. The campaign was originally designed to be six legs. They were not evenly distributed legs in time. We began in Tromso, Norway in September, the second half of September, 2019. And the way in which we were going to transfer research scientists and the ship's crew was a mixture of supporting research vessels, supporting icebreaker vessels from different nations and via aircraft. And in the end, Mosaic was actually five legs and not six, though the duration of our overall drift was approximately the same amount of time. We expected to be out there from September, 2019 to October, 2020, and we were. Um, the main vessel is Polar Stern. All of the scientists and crew lived on Polar Stern. We were allowed to occupy the ice for short periods of time, as I said, for measurements, but we never had any um, human-based camps outside of the polar stern. Everyone was back on the ship um, in the evening, and then we were back on the ice in the morning. So I was on, so it ended up being 
five legs. And I ended up being on, originally I was only going to be on two legs and then I ended up on three legs. So I was on legs one, four and five. Um, and that meant that I was at sea or working away from home uh, due to Mosaic and the pre-preparation phases um, for nine and a half months between September 2019 and October 2020. So I spent a lot of time in the field uh, these last years. And yeah, that, that's the longest I've ever been in the field. Five and a half months was like four. So we were in quarantine on May 1st. And I didn't get back to Bremerhaven until October 12, 2020, when the Polar Stern returned. So it's a very long stint. Um, we have polar bear safety training. We also have um, polar environment training, how to behave in a polar environment, how to see the signs of um, the onset of early hypothermia, how to uh, rescue yourself should you fall through the ice, what types of precautions to have, how to drive a snow machine. Um, yeah, all different types of things to prepare yourself. Things that were important, mm, snacks. Snacks are always important. Coffee, if you like coffee, which I do. So snacks and coffee, very important. Um, and also finding ways to decompress. I think that's most important because as I said, people are the most complex aspect of these projects and making sure that you are taking care of yourself and taking care of your team um, is really important. So psychologically supporting one another, finding ways um, to create a community of support while you're trying to do really, really intense work. Yeah, so those are just some of the things in the field, yeah. So in a nutshell, you had safety training and yes. then you got on a boat and then you basically calculated how you would drift. Yeah. And, and that's, very simplified the expedition. Yeah, that's a simple expedition. Yeah, we had buoys that had been deployed in the ice many, many years ago. And we know the trajectory of those ice buoys. We use that data to inform how the polar stern might drift, which helped dictate where we should begin the drift if we wanted to stay in the ice for a whole year. Um, yeah, and we calculated an average speed and all of that stuff. So yeah. Yeah, that's the simplified version. In reality, it's much more complex, but. Yeah, I, I heard. <laughs> um, I think we might have time for one last question. Um, let me choose one. Um, oh, maybe you could tell us something about your daily routine on the Polar Stern. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, the daily routine. <laughs> So the Polar Stern, oops, sorry about that. The Polar Stern, uh, it's a ship. And for those who are not familiar with ships and living on a ship, they have a standard daily routine. Meals are served every day at the same time. Um, and so much of your life on the ship is dictated by those routine schedules. So the first thing that we would do um, on Polar Stern is we would have breakfast. Breakfast begins at 7.30. Um, and then we would have a morning meeting at 8.30. And the morning meeting was very brief and it was just to make sure that everything overnight had happened in an okay way that allowed us to be on the ice and to proceed with the day's plans. And so at that point, the uh, gangway goes down off of the polar stern onto the ice. And most people who are working on the ice are able to get onto the ice at nine o'clock. Um, in some instances, teams will come back onto the ship for lunch, which begins at 1130, and other teams will work through that period. Um, but the most, most of our days ended at 530 p.m. because dinner is served at 530 um, till 630. And then we would always have a nightly evening meeting. And this was the long meeting to recap what we had done in the day and to also assess what plans were needed for the following day. So this was approximately anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour. And it gave everyone a chance to regroup and talk about what they had observed. Um, we also included scientific presentations, um, but most often it was really a, a practical planning session. Several nights of the week, we have um, social gatherings for the, for the scientific party and the crew. Um, and this is casual setting on board the ship where you can have a beer or a wine and talk um, and meet. We also have a small gym on board with a small swimming pool and a sauna. And so that is open every day for people to, to enjoy and to use, again, to help with decompression. We have a small library 
on board and other social spaces for people to play board games, to watch movies, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the time, um, a lot of people were working well into the night, processing data, um, preparing for the next day, working in the lab, my team especially. But yeah, that's kind of a day in the life of, of being on the polar stern. And then, you know, one day kind of blurs to the next because you're back up having breakfast, getting ready to be on the ice or working from the ship. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I think that's a, that's, you often underestimate the part where you need to decompress and have time for yourself mm -hmm. and, or, you know, have fun. Yeah. Yeah. We work every day of the week. Um, weekends sometimes are, are special, but we work every single day. Every single day out there is precious for us. And so we may have occasionally reduced hours, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to us whether it's Sunday or Wednesday. Wow. Thank you. And mm -hmm. that is about our time. Okay. Um, yeah, I would end the, the, the presentation for now. We do have a little after meeting with our team. If you could spare a few more minutes sure. for us. And yeah. So and I want to, oh, sorry. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> I would just send you the link by email in a few minutes if you have time. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. We can just leave this meeting and then, but to all the students, and I know a lot of you are leaving right now, I still have a few words for you, uh, organizational stuff. Sorry, Danny, that's, that's about it. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, tell, to say thank you and wish everyone a good evening. Thank you so much again for having me. And thanks for the great questions. I will see you on the, on the next, the next, In the next meeting. meeting yes. Okay, sounds good. Okay, und jetzt nochmal ein Wort an die Studierenden, denn 